Hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good evening to you. Welcome to Warfare Wednesday here at Holy Cross Mission Baptist Church. I apologize. I'm about six minutes behind. Um, but nonetheless, we are here tonight, and I trust that you've had a wonderful day on this nice, snowy night. Facebook, we don't own the rights to this music. This is All in Your Hands by Marvin Sapp. And I suggest you, ladies and gentlemen, do the same thing. And that is that you put it all in the Lord's hands. All in His hands. I know you're glad tonight that we're inside, not outside, on this nice, snowy Wednesday evening. Facebook, we don't own the rights to this music. I don't know if I said it or not already, but we don't own the rights to this music. Uh, this is music that we just do for our worship experience. All right, so listen, I'm going to go ahead and shut my mouth since I was six minutes behind, and we're going to go ahead and get into uh, our lesson. But prior to that, I do want to make mention that we are still praying for the sick and the shut-in. We're still praying for uh, Sister Gwen Edwards, um, that God will, will touch, heal, deliver, set free, and make whole. Uh, we're praying for uh, Cynthia Watkins, uh, that God will touch her and and heal her, deliver her as well. And we're praying for so many, many others and many of you, um, God's children. God is still a miracle working God. He is still a God uh, that can get things done that we cannot get done ourselves. And so I think that we should uh, completely surrender over to him and let God do that which only he can do. All right. We're going to go ahead and get into our discussion tonight as we are continuing our uh, fruits of the spirit found in Galatians chapter number five, uh, somewhere around the 22nd verse. Um, we've been dealing with that for a few weeks now, and we want to continue until we exasperate the nine gifts or nine fruits rather of the spirit. So let us go ahead. You need your Bibles. You need your pens and your paper. Uh, I trust and hope that this is going to be a blessing to you, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate your hearts and your stars. Thank you so much. I ask that you will continue to send up your hearts and your stars. That's how I know that you are interacting with me. I uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, those of you that share and share faithfully and religiously. Thank you so much for your shares. Thank you for your likes, your follows. Uh, thank you for your word of mouth uh, to let others know that uh, the Spirit of the Lord is present at HC. All right, so we know that we left off with the third fruit of the Spirit, um, which I believe was peace. Let's see, love, joy, peace. I think it's peace. Uh, tonight we're going to deal with the fourth fruit of the Spirit, um, again found in Galatians chapter number five, uh, which is uh, patience. Patience is the fourth fruit fruit of the spirit amen amen now just as a simple foundation we want to look at the uh, webster's definition of patience and patience is simply described or defined as this the capacity to accept or tolerate delay trouble or suffering without getting angry or upset that's the definition of patience now in layman's term uh, patience is the ability or willingness to put up with something or someone that causes you trouble or grief without tripping all right uh, we'll put it in our layman term layman's terms as well as our ebonics uh, patience can also be uh, waiting on something or tolerating something. That's the foundation of, of patience. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, patience is something that you don't see very often in the world in which we live now. Um, for some reason, it has become obsolete uh, when we deal with people in society. Um <clears throat> Not only is everyone in a hurry to get what they want to get or get where they want to go, uh, but many people are also many people also feel that what they want or what they need uh, supersedes the importance of others. Um, 
they think that they can cut the line of life um, and take cuts like you would at an amusement park or something and get ahead uh, of everyone else. Why? Because the lack of patience, uh, the lack of concern for others, um, and they, for some reason or another, has uh, made themselves more important um, than anyone else. Big eyes and little use. Um, you may have experienced people or someone like that in your own life uh, where it's always about them and never about anyone else. Uh, even in this position of pastoring, um, I quickly found out that the most difficult part of pastoring is not preaching. The most difficult part about pastoring is people. Um, everyone has an agenda. Everyone has a personality. Um, everyone has emotions and feelings. So I found out very quickly, ladies and gentlemen, that it's not the preaching, it's dealing with some people um, that just seem to uh, want to try your patience or um, challenge your patience, if you will. Um, <clears throat> Um, and that usually happens when um, when you do not respond fast enough to someone's complaint or concern or you do not respond in the fashion that they thought, hoped or wish that you would. And when that occurs, I find out that you uh, end up in the doghouse with people uh, because you are not responding or handling things the way. Uh, some people wish you would, hope you would, thought you would, or um, some cases commanded that you would. Um, so us um, under shepherds, if you will, find ourselves in dog houses because we do not respond the way uh, that some people feel. Um, <clears throat> I, it never ceased to amaze me, though, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to this topic of patience. When it comes to this topic of, 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 of dealing with people and, and issues, I've always been fascinated at the fact that people in the world and the church for that matter, uh, people can stand in a line, a line for hours and maybe even days on a Black Friday so that you can be the first or one of the first individuals in the store to grab a deal. You will stand in line forever at a concert so that you can get in to see your favorite artist or your favorite performer. People will stand in line forever to get good food. I pass Popeye's chicken and every Popeye's chicken or Chick-fil-A. Let's go with Chick-fil-A. Uh, I've seen the lines literally wrapped around the corner so that you can get a chicken sandwich. You will stand in line and, uh, uh, and, and experience patience in almost any situation that you find important. But when it comes to being patient with your brothers and your sisters, it amazes me at how short the fuse is when it comes to a godly patience. Doesn't that amaze you that we can just go throughout life and somewhat make up our own rules? Isn't that amazing? How everything is always applicable for situations or two situations that we deem important that we deem necessary. But for some strange reasons, we cannot seem to be patient for five minutes with a brother or sister in Christ. It's amazing at how we can never seem to step into the God line and guidelines of biblical patience. And what really trips me out 
is we can't seem to be patient with one another. Yet we're always looking for God to be super patient with us. I'm pausing for a second because I really want that part to sink in. We have short fuses with one another. But when we are at fault or we need God to be patient with us while God waits for days, weeks, months, years, and even decades for many people to grasp the concept of biblical principles, to grasp the concept of interchange. God has been waiting on a whole lot of us for a long time. Yet, we can't be patient with other people. I said this once before, you may have seen it and read it. Here's what I said. While you are trying to figure out or concerned why God is taking his time to answer your prayers, whatever those prayers may be. God heal me, God deliver me, God I need this, God I need that. While you're concerned and wondering why God takes his time at times to answer your prayers, at the same time you should be grateful and thankful that he also takes his time to judge you for your sins. So while you may be flaking out over the fact that God has not come through for you yet, you should also take the time to tell God thank you that he hasn't put his foot down on some of our behaviors. And just as God is patient with us, biblical principle teaches us that we ought to be patient with other people. It's amazing to me at how one-sided things can be even in the church. When someone else mess up, oh, correction, when you mess up in life, you want all the mercy God can give you. Matter of fact, you ask for extra mercy. You ask to be graded on a curve. But when someone else mess up and or hurt your feelings, you want to immediately send them to the electric chair. Now, I understand that certain aspects of the fruit of the spirit will be accepted more than others. <laughs> I understand this ordeal tonight of patience more than likely won't be accepted by most people. Matter of fact, in my opening argument, most of you probably put your devices down and went and grabbed a bag of chips. You might be popping some popcorn right now, warming up your, your dinner from last night, your leftovers or whatever case may be. You might even be on the phone texting. You might be on another social media outlet. Why? Because this is not intriguing to you. It's not interesting to you. That's fine. The point is, is tonight we're talking about patience, one of the fruits of the spirit. Now, Let's see what God has to say about this patience. Uh, the first scripture we want to go to tonight is 2 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 9. 2 Peter verse number 3. I'm sorry, chapter number 3, verse number 9. And of course, you already know what I'm reading from. Here is what 2 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 9 says. It says, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise. Uh, your Bible, King James Version, more than likely says slack. But it says, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think so. And I'm some, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed or perish but wants everyone to repent. Watch this. He says, I'll read it one more time. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. Um, it's basically addressed to the fact that 
many people, especially in the biblical time, were under the impression that God was on his, that Christ was on his way back during their tenure. Um, they lived their lives, lives as if God, or Christ rather, was on his way back while they were still living. And it seemed to take longer than some had anticipated. So some people were under the impression that, hey, what's taken him so long to come and to straighten things out and to rescue us or to, uh, 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 to take us? So the notion is God is not actually uh, being slothful, if you will. He's not um, overlooking his promise as some people think he is. But God is being patient for your sake because he don't want anybody to perish. He want everybody to repent. So what God does is he takes his sweet time in the process of judgment, in the process of some corrections to, to give us time to recognize the faults, failures, sin, iniquities, and transgressions so that we can come back and repent and get back in the proper position uh, in, 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 in our relationship with him. So it's a good thing that God takes his time. It's a great thing that God is patient. A lot of people will say this. I've heard many people say this. This world is crazy, in which it is. There's a lot of turmoil, a lot, a lot of chaos, a lot of confusion, a lot of crime, a lot of stuff right now is going on. You watch the news or listen to the news, you know that there is a lot of heinous things going on in this world. And what a person would do, especially from church, they would say, I wish the Lord would come back and clean house. No, you don't. You think you do, but you really don't. Because when God comes back to clean house, he not just going to clean certain houses. <laughs> that means your house is going to get in check too. See what I'm saying? So whenever we look at everybody else's issues, we always want God to come back and handle them. But when God handles their issues and their unrepentance, he's going to have to handle yours. So the truth is, you really don't want God to hurry up. Because if he hurries up, hurry up and come back, that means he's going to have to check you too and me, right? So it's a good thing, this Second Peter chapter number three, it's a good thing that God is patient and that God does take his time because that gives us time to be convicted and make some turnarounds in our lives. Does that make sense to anybody tonight? So it's good that God is patient and long-suffering in our lives. Now, watch this. Watch this. I know y'all hate when preachers and pastors do this, but that sometimes is necessary to show you the totality of the circumstances of biblical principles. I know you don't like it, but just ride with me tonight for a few minutes. We're talking about patience. There, uh, there are two Greek words uh, that describe or are or is translated um, as the word patience. Um, like I said, I know y'all don't like this whole Greek and Hebrew stuff. Uh, and sometimes I agree it can be unnecessary. But there are scriptures and topics where it's important for us to look at the original language uh, that's written in the Bible. And so there are two words, once again that describe the word patience. Number one, the first Greek word that you will find in New Testament translation. There's two words that you'll find in New Testament translation. Number one is uh, cupomony. 
Hugh Pulmony. Hugh Pulmony. Hugh Pulmony. Um, Hugh Pulmony means uh, remaining under. It means to remain under. It it means it's described rather as a person uh, who remains patient under a burden or a challenging situation. Hupomony means that's translated in the Bible that that uh, translation of patience is a person that's patient during a sickness or patient in a crazy relationship, uh, patient, um, patient while they're waiting for things to, to turn around or change in their lives. That's hupomony. The second word that you will find in New Testament translation uh, that describes patient is microthumia. Uh, microthumia. Um, this word is the word that's found or translated rather in Galatians chapter number five. Um, hupomony is not, is not the translated word in Galatians chapter number five, verse 22, when it talks about patience as being a fruit of the spirit. Um, the translated word there is uh, macrothemia, um, which is the Greek word used there. It actually is a compound word. Uh, macrothemia is a compound word that comes from two different words to make up the word. Um, the first word that's in the compound is the word called macros. Macros means long. Um, the second word that makes up that word is thumos. Thumos means uh, temper. It means temper. So um, thumos means temper and macros means long. So when you put the two compounded words together that form the macrothumia uh, in Galatians chapter number five, um, it literally means long temper. Also known or translated as long suffering. So it ultimately means a person that's slow to anger. So why is that important? Why, why do we need to know that? Because you need to know which word is translated in a certain text so you can get the proper interpretation. So Galatians chapter number five is not dealing with patience under a uh, circumstance or illness or something like that where you're waiting for God to turn things around. What Galatians is actually talking about, the patience that it's describing is patience in a long suffering or a long temper. So that's important because now we know that the proper translated word there is dealing with how to be patient with people and not just patient in your own personal issues. A patient person, ladies and gentlemen, does not seek revenge. A patient person does not seek payback, but instead a patient person waits for God to provide comfort and punishment for the wrongdoer. Did you hear what I just said? This macrothumia that we find in Galatians 5 is the patience of that causes you to endure wrongdoings or craziness from other people. And if you operate in the spirit of God through macrothemia, that means that you are a long suffering person. Like 2 Peter 3, 9 told us that God is patient on purpose. God could put his foot down. God could correct us, 
and deal with us in a much harsh way. But thanks be unto God that Psalms 103 says, you have not dealt with us according to our iniquities or reward us according to our sins. But your mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. So when Galatians talk about patience, the patience is how patient are you with your brothers and your sisters, right? Could it be church that the reason why uh, some of your, some of you all's problems as to why you can't seem to be patient with your brothers and sisters is because, um, is because the spirit of God is lying dormant in your life. Huh? Is that possible? Is it possible that one of the reasons why you're struggling with being patient with people or being patient when you have a thorn in your flesh by a person, um, could it be because the spirit is lying dormant? Could it be because you have not tapped into what's supposed to be living inside of you? Uh, could it be because you have chosen for one reason or another to operate in the flesh and not operate in the spirit? Because remember, uh, this patience is a fruit of the spirit, not a spirit. So maybe it's it's more uh, flesh and self that controls some of some of you uh, than it is the spirit of God. And that's that's a critical question that you may want to ask yourself, because um, if that's the case, uh, you may want to check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> right. So it's important for us to understand the principle behind the whole purpose. Right. Uh, you, you, some people may not like the question, but you got to admit it's a good question. Right. The only way we're going to operate in macrothemia or the patience of Galatians 5 is by the power of the Holy Spirit. There's no way on the earth that you're going to be able to practice patience like God practiced patience on your own recognizance. I don't care what you try to do. I don't care how you try to hype, hype yourself up and tell yourself a million times. I don't care how many notes you leave on the bathroom mirror. I don't care how many notes you leave to yourself on the steering wheel of your car. The truth is that you'll never have this kind of patience unless the spirit of God is operating in your life. Does that make sense, right? Now go to Romans chapter number two, verse four. Go to Romans chapter two, number four. Romans chapter number two, verse four. I hope and pray that you are literally turning with me in your Bibles. Chapter two, verse four. Watch this. <clears throat> Here's what it says. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean uh, nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? See how this cosigns for Second Peter three and nine that says he's he's patient on purpose because he want everybody to repent here. It says, don't you see how kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Doesn't this mean anything? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? God is patient on purpose. And he's patient to give us time to recognize and realize that we don't have it all together and we need him to get to where we need to be. All right, let's keep going because I like I like Bible. I like Bible to teach itself. I'm just talking. I like for the word to teach uh, what we should do because I don't want you ever leaving warfare Wednesday or Sunday morning worship uh, saying that these are my own agendas and ideas. I want to point these things out to you in the Bible. Go to Ephesians chapter number four. Go to Ephesians chapter number four. Let's look at verse number two, uh, verses two and three, rather. 
Ephesians chapter number four, verses two through three. Ephesians chapter number four, verses two, two through three. Here is what it says. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Watch this. Making allowance for each other's faults. Faults. Because of your love. Now, this is not even the text that's dealing with the fruits of the spirit. But see how the fruits of the spirit are in these texts. You got love and you got patience. Why? Because they all go together. Always be, I'm going to read that part again. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. See how they connect? When you operate in love, you can operate in patience. Does that make sense? Am I making sense? If I'm not, let me know. He says, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit. Binding yourselves together with peace. My God, right there, we find a host of fruits of the spirit. <laughs> Love, patience, and peace. We find that in two scriptures right here. See that? It says, make every effort, every effort to keep yourselves united, united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace so the way you bind yourselves together is with peace love and peace are the glue or are the glues if you will that keeps us bound together you know if you have something you're trying to glue it together and put something together anybody ever used some cheap glue before uh, you remember growing up, uh, you would have Elmer's glue when you would make your little projects, right? You put your little stick men together or you put your little paper stuff together and you, you making something, right? You use Elmer's glue. Elmer's glue was fine for stuff like that, right? Um, but you couldn't use Elmer's glue to glue back a coffee mug. Not strong enough. Uh, doesn't have the power that you need to glue something back to that magnitude. So when you wanted to glue something together real good or something that needed to be glued uh, uh, pretty permanent, you pull out the super glue, the crazy glue or gorilla glue, right? Because that glue has the power to hold together. Let me help you tonight. The glue that God is looking for us to use is love, patience, and peace. Without those, you can't be bound together. Without the biblical glue of love, patience, and peace, there's no way in the world you're going to be able to bind yourself together and be humble and gentle and, and make allowances for each other's faults, as the scripture says. But you have to have that glue uh, that will bind you together, right? And as I've always said, and I'll continue to say, is that uh, the whole purpose of Bible study, uh, church services, the whole purpose of personal and private fellowship and worship, um, the whole purpose of reading and studying the Bible is to learn what it says so you can do what it says. There's no purpose of us even meeting together if there are no intentions on actually taking God's word at, at, it, at, it, uh, at heart, right? Doesn't it always amaze Amaze you, amazes me. I don't know about you, but doesn't it amaze you at how we can stand strong on the word of God when it comes to the word of God that says he's about to bless us with something? Ask and it shall be given. Seek you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. Uh, Glory be to God, right? Uh, my God will supply all of my needs. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against me in judgment, I will condemn. For this is the inheritance of the children of God. We, 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 we go hard in the pain. <laughs> but just as important as those scriptures are, so are these. 
And if we're not going to look at the totality of the scripture, then what's the point of even coming by Warfare Wednesday? Nothing. You're just wasting your time and uh, getting nowhere fast. Does that make sense? Now this may, you know, like I said before, most people, you, you don't, this is not that kind of study or teaching or whatever you want to call it that make people shout. I get it. But what you don't understand is, is that um, every day we wake up, you and I is a blessing. And I said this before, but also we're one day closer to death. Not trying to scare you, not trying to burst a bubble. But the truth is every day we wake up, we're getting closer to one or two things. Number one, our death date or the return of Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says he's coming back like a thief, a thief in the night. We don't even know when he's coming back. He's just going to, and we, and he's here, right? So every day we wake up, we're getting closer to one or two things, his return or our departure. So since we keep waking up by the grace of God, thank you, Jesus, for that. But since we keep waking up, we're getting closer and closer to the point where we're going to have to meet him. So I don't know about you, but for me, it just makes a little sense to me to start paying attention to what the word actually says so that we can be ready. Does it make sense? <laughs> right? Makes sense to me. If it makes sense to you, let me see some hearts and some thumbs. If it don't, fine. It don't, okay, it is what it is. So since every day we're getting closer to one of those things, we might want to not just think about the hill supply of my needs. We also should be thinking about how can I become a better Christian? How can I become a, become a better soldier in the army of the Lord? Does that make sense? All right. All right, let's go back to Romans. I should have left you in Romans at that time when we was in Romans. But let's go back to Romans chapter number 12. Let's go to Romans chapter number 12. I like this verse right here. Romans chapter number 12. And we're going to read verses 19 through 21. Romans chapter 12, verses 19 through 21. I love the New Living Translation when it comes to certain verses. Here's what it says in the Bible. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, catch this, I will take revenge I will pay them back says the Lord instead if your enemies are hungry feed them goodness gracious if they are thirsty give them something to drink in doing this you will heap burning coals of shame on their head don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. I'm going to read this one more time because this sounds good to me. Dear friends, I hope you read reading with me. Never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God for the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will keep burn, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Let me translate verse 21. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Don't respond with evil, but respond by doing something good. Now, let me pause it for a second and just give you my editorial of that. Number one, that is not easy to do. The Bible, which is supposed to be our manual for life. Again, it's not just something you read when you're in the bathroom. It's not something you just read when you're in trouble and you want God to wave his magic wand to help your life out. But the Bible is full of instructions. 
Do this to please God. Do this to get that. Don't do this to get that. It's a host and a conglomerate of things that help us along the way to make us what he created us to be. No, it's not easy to give something to eat to your enemies. No, it's not easy to give something to drink to your enemies. Do you want revenge? Of course you do. Who didn't at some point in their life? Do you want to pay somebody back? Sure you do. I have wanted to myself. Do you want to give people the business who do you wrong, treat you wrong, step on you, whatever case it be? Of course you do. That's human nature, right? However, though you may want to, the Bible says don't do it. Because when you decide to do it, what you're doing is you're taking matters into your own hands. And what I have consistently said, and I will consist, I will continue to say this until the Lord calls me home or I get called up like Enoch and Moses. <laughs> uh, I'll continue to say this, and that is, God can do more to your enemies than you ever could imagine. I don't care what type of revenge you're planning. I don't care what type of payback you're trying to set up. I don't care what type of uh, snares and traps you're trying to set for your enemies. They cannot compare to what God can do to them. It is unfathomable at how God know how to handle your enemies. It's unsurmountable as to how God can handle your enemies. God has a plethora of ways of making your enemies enemies recant their position the bible is clear that when you leave them up to god and stop flaking and tripping and planning and and coercing and and and, and premeditating and all that kind of good stuff when you let god handle them it's handled. Now, how do I know that? Number one, because the Bible says it. And if the Bible says it, that means it's true. Why? Because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So we know the word is alive because the word is God. So he's still alive. We know that the word tells the truth because the word is God. And his word will stand forever. The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will stand forever. So his word is going to be, his word is concrete. His word was present in the beginning. His word is going to be present in the end. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and he spoke and then things began to form. So his word is always in control. That's the first reason I know that the Bible is true because God said so. The second reason I know that God knows how to handle your enemies and you don't have to handle them, your, them yourselves is because I have turned enemies over to God. <laughs> Man, I feel like preaching a little bit. I've turned enemies over to God. I'll tell you in a minute, I'm not going to fight you. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to try to plan against you. I'm not going to try to set nothing up or hold you back or trip you. I ain't doing none of that. I promise you I'm not. I'm going to go down on my knees in my prayer closet or my prayer place that I go to on a daily basis, my prayer place, and I'm going to submit your name. <laughs> and I'm going to submit your name and let God do what he do. Can I get a witness in this room tonight? I've done it in the past and God has handled it. I'm currently doing it and God's handled it. I'll continue to do it and let God handle it. Because like I said before, God can do some things to enemies that you ain't even think about. Not only did you not think about it, you don't even have the power to bring the past. <laughs> them little plans you trying to do, them little, I ain't talking to them no more. I ain't going to help them. I ain't going to do that. Another, or, or I'm going to see if I can uh, try to hold some stuff back and keep them at bay and, and not accept whatever it can be. That little stuff don't do nothing. The stuff that God know how to do, man, you better be careful. I tell people all the time, listen, be careful how you handle me, man. I'm serious about that. Be careful how you handle me. Not because I think I'm special and I'm all that in the bag of chips, because I don't and I'm not. 
but be careful because I belong to the king. And when I, when I do, when I try my best uh, to stay connected to him and stay in his good graces, when the enemies come against, it's like you coming against him. You know how it is with a parent, right? You mess with your kid, you mess with the mom and the daddy, right? Anybody ever had any problems with your kid has some issues at school or something like that? And your kid come home and you know you got a pretty decent kid. Ain't nobody perfect, but you know you got a pretty decent kid, right? And your kid feelings are hurt or whatever case it be. You come for my kid if you want to, right? And you got to deal with the daddy. God is the same way. Yeah, you can dig them ditches for my son and my daughter if you want to. But you're going to have to have, you're going to have to talk, come talk to me when I'm, when I'm ready to deal with you. Right? So it says, don't take revenge. Let God do what he do in every situation. And when you do that, it's amazing in how your patience will increase because now, you know, I ain't even got to handle you. I don't even have to do nothing to you. I'm going to let God do what he do. So I can be more patient with you. Because I know that at some point you keep tripping, God's going to have to handle you. Now, understand this. That does not mean God's going to throw them in front of a bus, right? God, I know you handle it, but if it be your will, cause them to get run over by a train. No, that's not how God operates. <laughs> God knows how to do things all kinds of ways. God can handle them in that kind of fashion that captures their attention. Or God can cause a spirit of conviction to come on them. God can cause them to be weeping and sobbing at three o'clock in the morning over what they did to you or said to you or treated you, whatever. And they come running to you saying, I am so sorry. Either way it go, I'm cool with it just as long as God handled them. I've had many situations, I promise you, where I've done that. Let me give you an example. One time I was, I think I was about 18 or something like that. Now I'm just going back. I, I can give you recent ones, but when I was about 18 or something like that, I was working at this place. For some strange reason, my supervisor did not like me. I don't know why, because I'm always cracking jokes. I always like to laugh. I always like making people laugh, right? Uh, I'm not saying I'm the best thing since sliced bread, but I think I'm pretty decent, right? Compared to people, compared to God, I'm filthy rags like all of us, but compared to people, I think I'm pretty decent, right? Um, and she just, she just didn't like me for whatever reason. Um, I didn't start tripping out. I didn't go through, go through no insubordination or I'm not, I didn't go out there and let the air out her tires or egg or car or anything like that. I went home at 18. I went home and prayed, God, thank you for this job. Thank you for the pay. God, you know, I'm having an issue at my job. I do not know why she does not like me. I have no problems with her. She has a problem with me. I'm asking you, God, to either remove this woman from her supervision position or change her heart where we can work together well. In Jesus' name, amen. Two weeks went by. Same stuff, right? We still, I'm still at work on eggshells. Something happened right around that third week or so. Can't remember what time frame it was. Next thing I know, this woman is talking to me. Um, she's laughing with me. To make a long story short, we went from being uh, enemies and she was my nemesis or I was her nemesis. We went from that to becoming so cool that when I left the job for another job, I would go back up there on some off days periodically just to say hello. And she would be elated to see me. We go from, I can't stand you, to, hey, how you been? Uh, sharing jokes, laughs, this, that, and the other. That was one way. I had another situation. This is more recent with, with my last career, yeah, right? Had another supervisor. I don't know if I shared this with y'all or not. Had another supervisor. Just... Love picking on people, had a problem, this, that, and the other. God know when you ain't feeling it. Anybody ever been there before? Where you say, today ain't the day. Um, if you come at me wrong today, it's going to be some furniture moving. Anybody ever felt like that before? <laughs> it's it's going to be some Batman and Robin type stuff, some pile, bang, crash. You know the words used to pop up on Batman that came on TV, right? It was one of those days. I was like, God, this today is not the day. 
uh, I need your help today because I'm operating 150% in the flesh. And it's going to be fist to face if this go down today. I meant it. God knew I meant it. So I need your help. I'm asking you, I said the same thing, remove or change. I'm sitting there, supervisor sitting there that I'm having an issue with. Next thing I know, the door's open. Somebody come whisper something in his ear and he storms out the room. I never saw him again because God removed him. What's my point? When you leave it up to God, he will either remove or he will change. Either way it go, I'm fine with it, just as long as you handle it. So the scripture says, do not take revenge. All right, I'm talking too much. I'm getting on y'all nerves. I get it. Go to Leviticus chapter number nine, 19. I showed you New Testament. I'm going to show you one in the Old Testament so you know that we're well-rounded in the Bible. We're not just talking on one side. We're talking on both sides. Go to Leviticus chapter number 19. And we want 17 and 18. This is a co-signing, basically, of what we just read. Leviticus chapter number 19, verses 17 and 18. Simply says this. Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your brethren. Y'all hear that? Now, what you need to know about these scriptures is that you see it right here. It says, do not take revenge. I'm sorry. It says, do not nurse hatred in your heart. That's a command, ladies and gentlemen. That's not a suggestion. That's not a good idea. That's a command. It opens and says, don't do it. Do not do it, which is a command, which means you and I don't have the option of obedience. It's a command. So that means it's imperative that we follow what the scripture says. Do not nurse hatred. <laughs> Do not nurse. You see that? Do y'all see that? Do you see what the scriptures say? Do not nurse hatred. Don't sit there and pamper hatred. Don't sit there and feed hatred. Don't sit there and, 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 and try to uh, cultivate hatred. Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your brothers or brethren. Confront people directly so you will not be held guilty of their sin. Wow. I'm not making this stuff up. It's right here in the Bible. And hopefully you're reading along with me. It says conf confront people directly. Instead of talking about them on the phone, instead of talking about them to your family, friends, relatives, or boo, it says confront them directly. Let me help you in case you're a little slow. If you got a problem with somebody, don't beat around the bush. Don't go by way of somebody else that know them or a mutual friend. Go to them directly, the Bible says. So, so you will not be held guilty of their sin. If that ain't scary, I don't know what it is. Because I don't know about you, uh, but I have enough sin in my own life. I ain't got time to be picking up nobody else's sin. Um, I, I don't have time to be trying to stuff another sin that somebody else is into my sin suitcase. <laughs> Does that make sense? Right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm busy trying to unpack my own sin suitcase. I ain't got time to be adding yours to mine. Does that make sense? So, so it says, so it says, uh, so you won't be guilty of, of their own, of their sins. Verse 18. Do, here it is again in this Old Testament. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow brother. That means fellow uh, brother and sister in Christ, right? It's really anybody but brother and sister in Christ. Uh, don't bear a grudge against a fellow brother and sister, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. I'm not going to read verse 19, but I'm going to give you the headline of verse 19. You must obey all my decrees. All right. Wow. Okay. 
If it's making sense, somebody make some heart thumbs up noise. Crap. Um, the opposite of patient patience is impatient. Okay. I got a question for you real quick before we get out of here. We're about to go in, in a few, few short minutes. I have a question for you. Why do you get bent out of shape over your enemies anyway? Why do you get bent out of shape? Why do you lose your cool and your composure when it comes to folk that don't like you? Or folk that have wronged you or treated you bad? Why? Well, it's human nature, right? That's all of us. All of us have those feelings and emotions, right? No one likes to be wronged. No one likes to be treated poorly. No one likes to give and never get. No one likes to go through those things. But but why do you seek revenge? Why, why do you go through that? Don't you know? I'm about to show you something tonight real quick. Don't you know that some people's assignment is to be a thorn in your flesh? I'm about to really help you before we get out of here right there. Some people are assigned to be a thorn. You don't believe me, do you? Judas had the assignment of being a thorn. Jesus already knew what Judas was going to do before he picked Judas to be a disciple. Don't you find it amazing that the thorn in Jesus' flesh was a person attached to his group? The thorn, the one who sold Jesus out for a few dollars, was not a stranger. Was not somebody that was technically against Jesus. He was not a part of the Sanhedrin council. He was not one of those self-righteous scribes and Pharisees. He was a traitor who was in the personal group of Jesus, hung out with the disciples, slept with Jesus when he went out of town, ate with Jesus. When I say slept with Jesus, you know what I mean. Uh, they they shared uh, uh, com accommodations together, right? Uh, ate with Jesus, drank with Jesus, laughed with Jesus, walked with Jesus, listened to Jesus. Yet his assignment was to be a thorn in Jesus' flesh. Ladies and gentlemen, what you may or may not know, that as crazy as this may sound, as difficult as it may be to grasp, but everybody is assigned a Judas. Everybody is assigned a thorn in the flesh. I don't care who you are and what you do, you're going to have folk that don't like you. You're going to have people that's going to mistreat you and do things against you. That's a part of life, number one. But those traitors and Judases, if you will, are only Judas when they are attached to your group. Wow. Did he just say that? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. That's one of the ways you can identify Judas because Judas has to be a part of your group somewhere. <laughs> Judas has to either be in your family. He has to be in, in, in a, a, one of your brothers and sisters at church or whatever. He, he, he's going to, he shows up as a part of the group, but Judas is necessary. I know you don't like dealing with Judas because I don't like dealing with Judas, but Judas is necessary because it had, had it not been for Judas, Judas is who sold Jesus out that assisted him to get to the cross. And we know how important the cross is. We know how important the cross was and the cross is. So Judas was necessary to help Jesus get to destiny. Wow. Come here. Come, let, me, let me talk for just a few seconds. So the Judas is in your life, though they may be a thorn in your flesh and make you want to pull your hair out, cuss, scream, and take a drink. The truth is, is that the Judases, the traitors, and the enemies in your life are important to get you to destiny.
That's why you should be somewhat thankful. You should at some point sit down and write your haters or your enemies uh, a nice thank you note. Because had it not been for you, Mr. or Mrs. Judas, I wouldn't have prayed as much as I did. If it wasn't for you, Mr. or Mrs. Judas, I wouldn't have found more God in my life. Is it, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be in the position I am now spiritually. I have more anointing. I have more power. I have more patience. I have more love. I have more peace. Why? Because Judas actually assist and promote you to destiny. It's the enemies that catapult you to the next level. So why do you get, why, why, why get so upset? Why get revengeful? Why, why pay back? Why go through all that? Why? Because I need you. Because, watch this, without a Judas, then Psalm 23 is inaccurate. Because Psalm 23 says, he prepares a table in the presence of my enemies, not in the presence of my friends. Not in the presence of my homies, but he prepares a table in the presence of my enemies. So you need them. <laughs> you need them to get the feast. You see what I'm saying? You need folk that don't like you so that you can eat good. My goodness. Thank you, God. That was good. I promise God just told me that right there. You need them so we can be patient. We can give the enemy food when they're hungry. We can, we can give the enemy something to drink like the scripture says that we just read. Why? Because they're necessary for growth and development. Jesus, knowing what Judas was going to do, did not trip out on Judas. He didn't treat Judas any different. He didn't tell Judas, hey man, you can't go with us on this trip. He didn't say, no, Judas, you cannot sit at this table and dine with us. He did not say, Judas, I know what you're going to do. Therefore, you have less assignment. Or I know what you're going to do. You're not going to be picked. He picked him on purpose, knowing that he was going to sell him out. But the question is, who actually got sold out? Because if you know the story, Judas gets convicted of his mess up. He goes out and hangs himself and dies. Judas now is off the face of the earth. Jesus through the through the uh the um through Judas being a traitor Jesus also dies but we got two different outcomes <laughs> G Judas die and he gone Jesus die and gets resurrected see what I'm saying so let Judas be Judas let the enemy be the enemy because what's going to happen is they going to have to deal with that. God going to deal with them and you going to go on. You may have to experience a cross like situation, but there's a resurrection. Only if you let God do it his way. Can I get a witness right there? Right. Right. Can I get a witness right there? So your enemies are actually necessary. We don't like dealing with them. It's difficult to be patient with them. But the macrothumia that we talked about in Galatians chapter number five, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be patient with people that are difficult to be patient with. Here it is in my clothes. So if you're one of the ones that fantasize about plotting or seeking revenge, pan people back or ways you can make people feel the way you feel or get even with them, then the spirit that drives that or drive those emotions is an evil spirit and not the Holy Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, it is entirely up to you as to how you treat, handle, and obey God's word. It's up to you. My job is to say extra, extra, read all about it like the little boy used to do with the newspapers back in the olden days, right? He would say extra, extra, read all about it. That's my job. I'm that little kid. 
that has a, a, a handful of, uh, has an extra copy and says, hey, extra, extra, read all about it. Now, what you do after you read it or we study it or we discuss it is entirely up to you. How you respond to his commands is entirely up to you. The fourth fruit of the spirit church is patience. You and I both can operate in patience only by the work of the Holy Spirit. Do I have a witness tonight? Right? All right. We're done with our lesson. I hope it blessed you. If it did, go ahead and share it and let someone else be blessed by it so that we can continue to do what God has called us to do. We're praying tonight once again for uh, Gwen Edwards, uh, Cynthia Watkins, and many more. So let's go ahead and, and pray as we close out tonight. Um, and then you ladies and gentlemen, be safe, be careful on the roads out there. Um, and remember to make God first in your life. Father God, we thank you tonight for another awesome session. I say awesome not because I am the one that was talking. I say awesome because you are the one who was talking. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your provisions. Thank you for your power. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to pray. God, we come tonight lifting up Sister Gwen Edwards. We come tonight lifting up Cynthia Watkins. We come tonight lifting up all those who are sick and afflicted, those that have ailments and issues. God, there are other names that I did not call because they wish not to be called, but you know who they are. God, we ask you now again, that you would completely bind the spirit, bind the manipulation, bind the mutation of cancerous cells. God, that word has taken us on a ride. Every time we turn around, the cancer word seemed to pop up. But God, I know, and so do many people watching tonight, that cancer and any other sickness and or disease cannot contend with your power. Cancer and any and every other disease, I don't care what it is, I don't care what stage it is, stage one, two, three, or four, cannot contend with the healing power that comes from your hands. Scripture after scripture has taught us and continue to teach us that you are a God of healing a God of restoring, a God of changing, a God that gives us beauty for our ashes. Your word says, by your stripes, we are healed. I speak it over the names called tonight and those that were not called that in the name of Jesus and the power of his blood may healing go forth through the Facebook channel tonight and cause the right proper healthy cells to overtake power and destroy cancerous and diseased cells. God, I'm asking that you would dispatch angels with the healing in their hands to touch and turn things around. 
God, we pray tonight because you told us we can. We pray tonight, God, because we know you've done it before. There are testimonies upon testimonies from people that have been in these crises and their bodies are now in remission and has been in remission for many years. They're living healthy lives. They're living strong lives. They're living productive lives because your word is true. It's living and it has all the power we, we need to sustain us in any crisis. So God, as your word says, you sent your word and healed them and delivered them from destruction. I pray tonight that you will lay your hands on Gwen Edwards. You lay your hands on Cynthia Watkins. And God, you'll lay your, name, your hand on the names that are on the sick and shunning list and the names that have asked me to keep it between them and me. But they've asked for prayer. I have no doubt in my mind that you can do it. You have done it before. And God, we trust. We trust your word. If we can put our trust in you to die and go to a heaven that we've never seen, we know we can trust you on the earth that we wake up and see every day. God, I'm asking that you would not just save them from their sins, but save them from the attacks of the enemy. Save them from destruction. I also pray for those family members that surround the sick and afflicted because that too can be taxing on their psyche. I pray that you would give them peace. God, we not only pray for physical healing, God, I pray tonight for spiritual healing. Those that have spiritual cancer. Those that seem to have difficult times to operate in the spirit and difficult times to be obedient to your voice, to your word. God, I pray now for, for forgiveness. I pray for conviction, God. Though we may not like your hand of conviction, your hand of correction, it doesn't feel good, but we know that it is, is, is present to bring a change in us. So God, I pray that you would keep us in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. All those that may be struggling in their spiritual walk, battling, going full back and forth from the flesh and the spirit. I get it. I understand all of us do. God, I pray now that you would touch in a special way. That you would free our minds from the lies that the enemy has told us. That you would free our minds from self-righteous activities and thoughts. Free us, God, from operating in the flesh. Forgive us for not putting you first. Forgive us, God, for ignoring your principles and for putting other people before you or even ourselves before you. I'm asking that you'll create in us a clean heart and renew the right spirit within us. God, because we know that the end is coming. And God, we know we don't want to hear you say, depart from me, you worker, worker of iniquity. I don't even know you. But God, we want to worship you in spirit and in truth. So I pray tonight during this Warfare Wednesday that you would send a spirit of unity. Help each one of us to see our own faults and failures. 
Help us to stop judging others and blaming others and it's always somebody else's fault as to why we're in this situation or condition. Help us to see the error of our own ways so that we can get ourselves together. Because how dare we look at the speck in our brother or sister's eye when we have a log in our own eye. I pray tonight, God, that there will be a spiritual awakening, a rushing mighty wind to go through every home that's represented in this life tonight, that there will be a change, God. Don't let them go to bed and wake up the same way, but as they sleep tonight or go to bed, let them wake up recognizing and realizing that they need a closer walk with you. Because of the closer we're connected to you, the better, the more we'll be connected to one another. God, I plead tonight that there will be a washing and a cleansing by the Holy Spirit. God, that we will no longer operate just any kind of way or how we want to operate, but we will be led, guided, instructed, and commanded by the very word that you have placed before us. I pray, God, that we will be not just hearers, but doers as well. I understand, God, that everybody's not going to get it. Some people, God, no matter what they go through, or no matter what you do or what others do, some people just won't get it. Some people will not repent. Some people will not turn in, in, in back towards you. But I pray tonight that those that are watching, whether it's tonight on live or whether they watch it later on through a share or whatever the case may be, I pray that when they view it, that they will be snatched and arrested by the Holy Spirit, convicted at the same time, so that they can run with their arms open and say, God, I'm sorry for making my own decisions. I'm sorry for making matters worse because I operated in my own way. I'm asking God that you would just change and shift the atmosphere. Because what's really important is how we please you and not how you please us. What's really important is not getting everything we want but giving you what you want and what you request from us. Help us to take the focus off of ourselves and put it on the need of others to operate in love, peace, patience, joy, and long-suffering. Help us to operate in the spirit of kindness. God, help me. Help us to be the first to apologize to somebody that we've offended. Even if they offended us, help us to be receptive and to love our enemies as ourselves. God, as you prayed in John 17, that you would make us one as you and the Father are one. I pray, Lord Jesus, the same thing, that we be one as you and the Father are one. Those sins that so easily beset us, that captivate our attention time and time again, those thorns in our flesh, those Judases that we have to deal with, those enemies that are relentless, those enemies that smile and smirk and laugh even at the the, at the detriment that they've caused us. The enemies that don't want to apologize, that don't want to set the record straight. I pray that you would not only give us the spirit of Christ, that we'd be able to deal with them the way he dealt with Judas, but we do pray that you would deal with Judas. For your word says, vengeance is yours. And God will release it tonight so that you can handle that which we cannot. 
We release those people to you tonight. Those problematic people, those troublemakers, those inconsistent people. Even if it's ourselves. Snatch it out of us. Snatch it and burn it out of them. And we give vengeance. We, we, we completely turn over to you. In your hands. It is in the name of Jesus Christ. It is in the promises of your word the power of his blood and resurrection that we make these pleas, these declarations these requests by prayer and supplication it is in your name we pray and thank you now in advance for what you are going to do thank you for what you've already done thank you for what you're going to do in the name of of Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray. Amen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we went well over tonight. I apologize, but to God be the glory. That's our night. That's all we have tonight. Bless you. Don't forget this coming Sunday is fifth Sunday, which means we will be here again on Facebook Live for Sunday morning worship. Until then, be blessed. Stay prayed up. And let God do what he do. You can never go wrong by letting God do what he do. I love you with the love of Christ. And I pray that you love me the same. I will see you according to the will of God on Sunday morning. God bless you and be blessed.